Christians look forward to going to an eternity in heaven with the Lord, where we'll have no fears of any kind or any troubles in the world to come. But did you know that the Bible actually promises, if our faith can receive it, that we can begin to have royal dominion in this life? Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we won't have trials, adversities, and tribulations because that's all part of our training, our spiritual boot camp, so to speak. But in the midst of the trials and tribulations, we can have many victories. Victories are part of being an overcomer and doing exploits for the Lord. Hello, I'm Christine Darick. My spiritual journey began when I received the Lord as my personal Savior when I was about six years old. I went forward publicly at the altar call at the invitation of my father, who was an evangelical Presbyterian leader in the USA. Bless his memory, Daddy always gave an altar call for sinners to receive the Savior, and a child is never too young to grasp the gospel. In fact, Jesus said we must become humble like little children in order to receive the Lord. But like most people who receive the Lord for many years, I had no idea, and even now I haven't fully comprehended, the benefits and privileges that I received in this word as a saved, born-again child of God. All the promises of God became mine potentially, when I got saved, because God became my Heavenly Father. But of course, being a faith God, He expects us to believe His promises in this Word in order to walk in victory. I'm always encouraging people who are trying to believe God in light of impending doctor's reports. I ask what the Bible asks, whose report are you going to believe? The fallible report of a mere human being? or the report of the infallible great physician. Before they will praise God for their healing according to his word, many wait for the doctor's verdict. But real faith believes God before the doctor's report. If the medical report says you're healed, praise the Lord. But if the report says you're not healed, you can still praise the Lord and not go into a panic or a downward spiral of unbelief because the Lord's promises are greater and they're not contingent upon time or circumstances. The symptoms can still be present, but the healing is assured. And so we can go merrily on our way, even in pain, knowing that the great physician has promised to deal with it sooner or later. He watches our faith. And when our faith has fully pleased God, the attack will be taken away. Will your determination of being healed be according to a medical report or will your determination be based upon the guaranteed healing report of the Lord in this book? If you decide now that you are healed and proclaim your victory based solely on the word of God, you'll achieve a great victory. And to illustrate what I'm talking about, I want to share a great testimony from the life of the well-known healer and intercessor from Wales, Rhys Howells, the founder of the Bible College of Wales. In the last century, tuberculosis was considered to be incurable. Rhys Howells took a man with TB to a warmer climate, to Madeira, in the hopes of a miraculous recovery in the better weather. After two months in a hotel, the patient, who was named Joe, showed no signs of improvement. He was dying. So Reese Howells boldly took a stand. He said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. And then Howells said he heard the voice of the Lord say, a month today, Joe will be restored. Well, at first, Joe couldn't grasp the good news, but in a day or two, he had taken a hold of the rhema word by faith. That night, Howells met the wife of the island's missionary, and she routinely asked about the patient. Oh, Howells said he's very ill, 
but the Lord has told me he's going to heal Joe in a month. Well, it seemed incredible, so she gasped. How can you say such a thing? You know it can never happen. His lungs are nearly gone. She said, it's never happened before. But Howells replied, and I'll never forget reading this statement. It's never happened before because of unbelief. Amen. Meanwhile, Howells had posted a letter to Wales saying that Joe was to be healed in a month's time. And his mother showed the letter to Joe's doctor in Wales. Well, the doctor laughed and said it was impossible, but he also admitted that he would become a believer if it really happened. Well, it was now like a month's holiday in Madeira for Reese Howells because this case no longer needed prayer because he had the Lord's word on the matter. The Lord had said Job would be healed, so they simply trusted God at his word, and so they were as carefree as birds. A week before the healing, Howells booked their passage back to Wales. Many on the island were watching for the outcome with keen interest. But on the morning of the healing, Joe said, There's no change. I'm exactly the same as yesterday. So Howells asked the Lord what was the cause of the delay. And at once the Holy Spirit challenged him. The Holy Spirit said, Will you send a cable by faith declaring Joe's healing? Because the Lord said, If you take the healing from me against what you can see, if you believe solely in the word of God, you will have gained a higher position. Well, only a real faith in God could make him do it. But the Lord also brought to Reese Howell's mind the case of the centurion servant in the Gospels. Would he dare to believe God's word like the centurion did against what he could see? So after wrestling for an hour, his faith came right through to sending the cable simply based on the word of God before the actual healing could be seen. He went to the post office and he cabled one word, victory. The next day was Sunday and at noon, both men were sitting outdoors waiting for lunch when the Lord came down on Joe like a shower of rain and he was healed instantly on the spot. He was dancing with joy. And so he challenged Reese Howells to run a race with him and he outran Howells. Joe was like Elijah running before Ahab. It was joy unspeakable, not only for the healing, but the victory of faith. They were helping to recover the healing message that is clearly revealed in this Bible, if we will only believe. And so when they returned back home, Joe's doctor couldn't find a trace of the disease. And Joe went to the chapel that Sunday and said, look here, a doctor can't do anything, but go and try the Lord. And I must also share the highly edifying footnote to this testimony, which has greatly impacted my life through the years ever since I read it. Soon after they returned from Madeira, Mr. Howells found himself coughing up blood. Because of his close association with the patient, it was likely that he had caught the disease. However, and this is such an important point, his inward peace was not disturbed. And because his peace wasn't disturbed, he ignored the symptoms and the symptoms disappeared. It's important to realize that many times we stir up trouble when symptoms appear, if we have peace in God's word on the matter, why should we do anything but trust God? Going about our daily routine and the symptoms will disappear as we confess our sins and walk as God's obedient children. What a shame not to know what rightfully belongs to us as children of God. You see, Jesus said he's given us power and authority over evil spirits. But do you believe that? Do you really believe it? Well, we are not against doctors and medicine, but we are for trusting in the word of God. And when we have a rhema word like they had, we must stand on it. 
So Jesus said he's given us power and authority. And let's take, for example, when a believer moves into a new house. Do you have authority to cast out evil spirits? You may have an uneasy feeling in the new place if it hasn't been spiritually cleansed and consecrated. Just this week, I was fellowshipping with a friend who was telling me about buying a new house. It was new even though it was 100 years old, new to her. And so a lot had gone on in that property previously. One night, the new owner felt an evil presence sit down on her bed, and so she was frightened. So she and a friend went through the house and consecrated it and dedicated it to the Lord room by room, starting with the basement and commanding any evil spirits to depart in the name of Jesus. Only then did the owner have peace. And now she's been sleeping like a baby ever since. Every property that my husband and I have ever lived in, we've done this progressively as we've received more knowledge of the Lord and of his ways And we never fail to pray over a hotel room, even for one night. This, too, is part of ruling and reigning now in our circumstances in life. You see, we're told in Hebrews chapter 11, which is popularly called in the New Testament the Hall of Faith, that the parents of Moses overcame fear by faith. Think about it. Moses' parents were slaves to a tyrant, yet they boldly defied the edict of King Pharaoh to throw their baby into the Nile River to be eaten by the crocodiles. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 23. It says that by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months because they saw that he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. You see, Pharaoh had ordered that every Hebrew male child should be cast into the river. But instead of obeying this order, Moses' parents concealed him, even by ingeniously putting him on the Nile in a little waterproof ark. It's a great blessing when both parents have faith, and in the eyes of God, parents may lawfully hide themselves and their beloved children from the cruelty of bloody tyrants. So by faith, they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Faith has great power to overcome fear. Well, we're living in equally perilous times when Jesus prophesied that men's hearts will be failing them for fear. There was no doubt a severe punishment for anybody who would defy Pharaoh's decree. But faith makes a person wise as to how to behave in dangerous circumstances. Faith has a lion's heart to confront the difficulties and dangers. In 1 John 5, 4 is one of my favorite scriptures, along with all the other Bible verses in the Bible. It says that everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Every day you and I have a lot to overcome and to endure by faith persecutions, reproaches, betrayal, treachery, slander, misrepresentation. None of us is immune to adversity and tribulation, especially believers who are special targets of the powers of darkness. And many cancers are the result of unforgiveness. That too we have to get rid of. I can't afford to hold a grudge even for a moment. By faith, we are commanded always to be happy and and of good cheer because Messiah has overcome the world as the suffering servant on his first coming and as sure as the rising of the sun, he will return to Jerusalem as the roaring, conquering lion of Judah. So we can be happy that he's going to rule with a rod of iron and those of us who belong to him now are promised to rule and reign with him. But we can begin to rule now in this lifetime in many ways by controlling our self-life and conquering sin in our lives. You see, God originally designed us not to die. He designed our bodies to be self-perpetuating and so that we could have dominion over his creation to rule this world for his glory. 
But unfortunately, in the Garden of Eden, sin brought death. Through Adam, we inherited the curse of sin. However, and this is the good news of the gospel, sin no longer has to dominate those of us who follow Jesus because we've been adopted as God's children. By the Spirit, we have the daily choice of conquering sin and growing in holiness. And in that line, Psalm 110 is so very powerful. I thought I think of this verse often. It says, The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be willing in the day of your power to rule and reign and to be willing volunteers in the Lord's army. And so here are some important scriptures to memorize so that we can rule and reign to proclaim and demonstrate the authority that the Lord has given us. Psalm 118 and verse 17 is one of my favorites. It says, it declares, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Now, of course, we know that all of us are going to die, barring the rapture, of course. But this verse means that I shall not die prematurely, but I shall fulfill the number of my days in order to declare the works of the Lord. We don't need to cower because of lawless men. And Psalm 27, verse 1, is another favorite to declare in evil days. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? No one. Because 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, Thanks be to God who always gives us the victory by our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. And Romans 8, 11 is also very important because it proclaims that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives and dwells within us, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give to our mortal bodies through his spirit life because that life of God dwells within us. And this is a verse that has to be appropriated on a daily basis. If the Holy Spirit is indwelling me, he's greater than any sickness, any weakness, or any disease or problem that I may be facing. Psalm 91. Oh, such a wonderful psalm to memorize. And verse 16 is another specific rhema. It says, with long life, God is going to satisfy us and show us his salvation. For sure, we're, we're going through an aging process, but we can trust God to keep us with long life from sickness and disease and to constantly renew our youth and stamina, just like he did with Moses, Joshua, and Caleb in the Bible, so that we can live full, meaningful, and productive lives. As we believe and speak God's word in our daily lives, his resurrection life within us is release to recreate youthful vigor. In the Old Testament, God defined a cursed life versus a blessed life. If the people broke God's laws, they would be cursed. And sin could only be put away by blood. When Jesus came in the fullness of time, the final sacrifice he offered up on the cross was his own pure blood the atoning blood of the very Son of God, which cancels all the curses of sin for those of us who accept his atonement by faith. New Testament theology teaches that Jesus bore all the curses of the law on the tree of Calvary, and on his head he bore a crown of thorns, emblematic of the ground that was cursed through sin back in the Garden of Eden an aspect of the curse that Jesus willingly bore for us was premature death. You see, when he was 33 years old, in the prime of his life, he died for us. He suffered the curse of an early death so all who trust him as Savior could live the fullness of a long life. But many are confused on the issue of the gift of long life offered in the Bible because of the Psalm of Moses that says that the days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, it's all soon cut off and we fly away in death. 
And this verse is followed by the words, who knows the power of your anger. But this well-known passage describes the specific lifespan of a specific generation of Israelites who died under judgment in the wilderness due to God's anger at their unbelief. But those who had believed God's report about the promised land, Joshua and Caleb, didn't die. They weren't cut off at age 70 or 80. They had their youth renewed. And then Moses wrote the next Psalm, Psalm 91, which describes God's will for any of his people who choose to live under his blessings. Psalm 91 describes a long and satisfying life. And that verse 16 says, with long life will I satisfy him. So this Psalm is clearly teaching us that after living a long and satisfying life, your spirit can exit your body and go to God. Many godly men and women who've lived a long life know even the time of their departure and they announce it to their loved ones in advance. When Jesus returns to rule this world for a thousand years, as promised in the book of Revelation, then he will restrain sin and people once again will not die early deaths and they will live long lives, as did the patriarchs before Noah's flood. You see, Revelation chapter 20 speaks of the millennial rule of Messiah. During that soon coming time, Satan will be bound and put away. Therefore, his, uh, his constant influence to tempt people to sin will be put in check. God's law will go out to all the earth from Jerusalem. And the world will enjoy the peace of God and be completely safe. Atrocities by terrorists and crimes such as murder, rape, and thievery will be non-existent. It's hard to imagine living in a world with no crime but it's scheduled to happen on God's calendar. There will be a revival in the faith of God never experienced in all of history with Jerusalem as the worship capital of the world. That's why it's so important to watch Israel and see what God is doing. All war materials and weapons will be destroyed. And this period of the millennium is described in Isaiah chapter 2. And so I want to read to you what it's going to be like. It says, and it will come to pass and he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and his word from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. With Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords ruling over the throne of his father David, nations will no longer rise up against other nations, for the Prince of Peace will enforce the peace as a righteous theocrat. This will be the culmination of history. Messiah will be vindicated. The world will understand, finally, the purpose of his first coming to make atonement and his second coming to rule over the messianic kingdom. This world will finally live in harmony. National life will continue, but with unity and the sharing of knowledge. And Israel will be the head of the nations and not the tail. Technological advances that we have been seeing since Israel's restoration will increase exponentially and spread out from Jerusalem to all nations. God will prove to the so-called United Nations and other world courts that only he can engineer an era of true peace and security. And the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So don't despair when you see the world getting crazier and crazier because God is allowing the world at this point to show just how unruly it can be without his kingship. All of the sins that we hate like cruel child abuse will not be allowed to go on forever. Because of pressure, the nation of Israel will soon summons the Messiah to return. God is wrapping everything up and Jesus is getting ready to return and set things right and in order. So every day we look up and we cry, Maranatha, even so, 
come Lord Jesus and rule this world in perfect peace and righteousness so we can be relieved from the terrorists, the mayhem and disorder produced by godless sin. I hope you're ready for the return of Jesus. I want to extend an invitation for you to receive the Savior into your heart right now. The Bible teaches that if you will believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and be willing to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth he confesses unto salvation. So I urge you to settle this vital matter in your heart today. And then I also invite you to visit our website at exploits.tv where you can read about Israel in the news and learn details about our upcoming prayer convocations in the Holy Land to prepare the way of the Lord. We hold at least three prayer conferences annually in Israel, and each one is always strategic because every time you visit Israel, it's the most important time because ongoing Bible prophecy is continually unfolding. Also at our website, you can click online to receive an electronic copy of our free color news magazine called Exploits. And don't forget to connect with me on the social media. Daniel 11.32 says the people who know their God will be strong and carry out exploits. And in the Hebrew, that word means take action. So the life of God within us makes every day an adventure full of exploits. He puts his desires within our hearts and he puts his prayer burdens within our souls. So until next time that we're together, always praying for the peace of Jerusalem and contending earnestly for the faith, I'm Christine Dart. Shalom. The Jerusalem Channel is made possible by viewer support. Thanks for watching.